Welcome to another live Action for Happiness event. It's fantastic to have you with us uh, for this event from all around the world. Lovely to see you all greeting each other on the chat, as always, from so many different countries. My name is Mark Williamson. Um, I'm from Action for Happiness, and I'm delighted to be hosting this evening Dr. Judson Brewer. Dr. Judd, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Today's theme is unwinding anxiety, and I'm excited about our conversation because I'm a big fan of your work and your books, and I know you've got a lot that you can share with us and that we can then put into practice in our own lives and take out into our communities. As you know, our Action for Happiness community is really engaged not only on how we can look after ourselves, but how we can take care of each other and others around us as well. So you and I are going to have a chat, and uh, all of you are very welcome to participate. We're going to actually have some interactive questions and chance for you to respond in the chat wherever you are in the world. And then please do use the Q&A function to post your questions to Dr. Judd. We may not have time for all of them, but we'll certainly get to lots of the great questions that I know always come up uh, in these events. And you can vote on each other's questions too. Let's keep it as always kind and respectful and relevant in the chat. I know it's always a very supportive community. So thank you all for being here. Uh, Dr. Judd, you are you know, uh, an expert in many fields, particularly around um, behavior and habit formation. And, and, and we're talking today about anxiety. I wondered if we could start with you maybe showing a bit about your background and particularly what's brought you to this theme of anxiety. I'd be happy to. So by training, I'm an addiction psychiatrist. I'm also a neuroscientist. And I'm, you know, my titles are, I'm, the, I'm an associate professor at Brown University, where I'm the director of research and innovation at the Mindfulness Center there. I'm also an associate professor in psychiatry in the school of uh, in the medical school. And I, um, I'm the executive medical director of mental and behavioral health at ShareCare, which is a digital health company. So do a number of different things that combine uh, my interests and passions, which include, you know, as a psychiatrist trying to help people, but also as a researcher trying to figure out how to help people better, <laughs> if, that's a, if that's a way to put it. And I think those two actually came together, you know, going back to your question of what got me interested in anxiety, you know, a couple of things. One is that as a psychiatrist, I've struggled, you know, to help my patients with anxiety, the, the medications that are available, even the best medications out there are um, about one in five patients benefits from medication showing a significant reduction in symptoms. There's this medical term called number needed to treat. And the official number is 5.2. So about, you know, for every 5.2 patients that get that I prescribe medication, one of them is going to show a significant reduction in symptoms. And that actually, you know, causes uncertainty and anxiety for me, because I don't know which of the five patients are going to benefit. And I also don't know what I'm going to do with the other four. <laughs> so, so that's, you know, as a psychiatrist, I want to do the best I can. And also as a scientist, I had been developing behavior change programs. So we had uh, started, you know, geez, a while ago now, uh, over a decade ago, had started doing research, looking to see how we could help people quit smoking and had developed uh, a app called craving to quit. And then we had developed this program for emotional and overeating called eat right now. And we had just completed a study where we'd gotten this 40% reduction in, in craving related eating. And somebody in that program said to me, Hey, you know, anxiety triggers me to stress eat. Can you create a program for anxiety? And I was thinking, well, I prescribe medications for anxiety but it kind of put a bug in my ear, you know, because the, as I just mentioned, you know, not particularly effective at, at helping all my patients with anxiety with the medications. And so I went back and looked at the literature and I found something really interesting, something that I'd never learned in medical school or residency, which is that anxiety can be driven like any other habit. And that blew my mind because I was thinking, huh, I've been helping people, you know, developing programs for habit change for a long time. So I know how to work with habits, but I never thought about anxiety as a habit. And so long story short, and we can get into the details, but we developed this app called Unwinding Anxiety. And then as a researcher, you know, I want to see if it works. So we studied it and, you know, the, the, key statistic, we just published this in a paper last year, um, 
with people with generalized anxiety disorder. So we're looking at, you know, how can we help the people that are really hurt the most by this? Uh, in a randomized controlled trial, we got a 67% reduction in clinically validated anxiety scores. And just to put that in perspective, that number needed to treat for medications is 5.2. In this study, the number needed to treat was 1.6. So really, you know, we were really happy to see that, you know, targeting anxiety as a habit and even delivering a, a treatment through an app could actually help people significantly reduce their anxiety. So that's kind of the, the arc of the story of, you know, how I got interested in it. <laughs> I can also mention that Personally, I used to get panic attacks during residency, so I can personally attest to how challenging anxiety and panic can be. Mm, thank you for sharing that. And what a story, and congratulations on, on the great work. I saw someone in the chat talking about how the, um, the, your, your work has helped them quit smoking, and I know that I tried the Eat Right Now app and found that really helpful. So maybe we can come back a bit later and talk about habits more generally and some of those ad addictive behaviors. But on anxiety in particular, I mean, I guess it feels like it's an ever present, but particularly in the last few years, maybe with, this, with regards to COVID, or maybe it's about global issues around war and climate change or cost of living crisis, or even at the moment in where we are, a heat wave, there's all kinds of external as well as internal drivers of anxiety. So maybe in a moment we can come on to talk about what's going on with that. But I thought perhaps as always, we could involve the community at this point, Dr. Judd, and uh, maybe we could ask people to share something that's bringing them anxiety right now. How would you like to frame that? What's the right way to ask ourselves that question? Because I'd love us to sort of share together some of the sources of anxiety so we can at least see where we stand. I think that's perfect. What's a source of anxiety for you? Okay, so I'm going to read some of these out as they come up. Thank you for sharing, folks. Work, fatigue, the economy, the media, my health, my neighbours, university life, too many meetings on Zoom, pension, age relationships, back pain, job insecurity, being a parent, being judged, autism, uh, existential, sad for the planet, uh, family, no alone time, food sensitivities, um, yeah, social connection, personal arrangements, cancer, works coming up more, um, spouse, comparison to others, discrimination, being alone, children, Asperger's, uh, isolation, loss of human rights, money, bipolar, sex, politics. Um, wow, I think this is a pretty um, exhaustive list. What are, you, what are you feeling and seeing as, you, as these fly past? Yeah, just scrolling through this, wow, indeed. And I would venture to guess that if not all, I would say 99% of these share one thing in common, which is uncertainty. Mm. So they're... You know, our brains really do not like uncertainty <laughs> and that, that uncertainty can really drive anxiety for us. And it's, you know, whether it's uncertainty in what might happen, you know, with something uh, related to us in the future, but also I'm seeing from some of these responses, how other people might treat us and, mm -hmm. and uncertainty there. Uh, so something that we might explore a little more in depth, but this is really uh, a pretty exhaustive list, I would say. It's huge, isn't it? And thank you so much to everyone who's had the courage to share things there and, and actually just to hold space for the fact there's a lot of suffering there and a lot of sort of challenge. So, um, you know, I feel, I feel that very much from the community and yet somehow I feel a sense of connection to people as well, because it feels like this is somehow part of being human. And the fact that many of us struggle with at least some of these things all the time. Um, you talked about uncertainty. I wonder if there's also a sense of being out of control or things that are not within our control. Is that related as well? Absolutely. You know, if if we knew how everything was going to go and we knew that we could control everything, there would be a, a lot less anxiety in the world, for sure. Mm. So why don't we talk about why we get anxious then? Because it feels to me that in some ways this is a really helpful sort of evolutionary instinct to be worried about things that might be a danger or a threat in some way. But, uh, you know, maybe, could you say a bit more about why we, we have anxiety and, and what's going on there? Yeah, this is, it's pretty interesting. And we might think, well, there's got to be some evolutionary advantage or an adaptive feature of anxiety. But when you look at the research, there is, it's coming up close to zero in terms of anxiety being helpful. And it, my best sense of how that 
is why that's the case is that it's kind of, you know, it's our brains are taking two very helpful survival strategies and kind of mushing them together. And when they come to, you know, it's not like, you know, peanut butter and jelly or whatever the, you know, a good combination makes, makes each thing better. In this case, it makes each thing worse. <laughs> so if we look at uh, one very helpful survival strategy, it's around fear and learning, you know? And so if we, if, if there's something, let's say, um, you know, that proverbial something goes bump in the night and we wake up and we say, oh, what was that? We're a little afraid. There's some uncertainty that says, hey, get out of bed and figure out what that is. You know, it's unlikely that we're going to get back to sleep until we reduce that uncertainty or, at least, or even if we can't figure out what it is, it, it doesn't happen again. So fear can help us learn, you know, or let's use another example. We, let's say that we, um, you know, we step out into a busy street and we almost get hit by a car and then we have a fear response that says, hey, you know, put your phone away, look both ways before crossing the street. And we remember, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to look both ways before crossing the street. And we hopefully we learn from that. So fear is extremely important for survival, right? Now, if we also look at this other element, which is thinking into the future, planning has been this more recent evolutionary adaptation that our brains have, which is that we can start to think into the future. We can plan into the future. And we all know from our own lives how helpful planning is. You know, it's like I can plan my day. I can plan a trip. You know, I can plan meeting up with friends or family. That's really helpful as compared to just thinking, oh, maybe I will bump into my family sometime, <laughs> especially in modern age where we're you know, we're not as uh, in, all living in small communities like we used to, you know, a long, long, long time ago. So planning, helpful, fear, helpful. But when you mush those together, you think of planning as like future. Fear of the future is basically what anxiety is. You know, these, there are these formal definitions around, you know, this feeling of nervousness or unease or worry about something with an uncertain outcome. Well, guess what? The future has an uncertain outcome. <laughs> so if we start fearing what's going to happen in the future, our brains start running into these what if scenarios like what if this, what if that, what if this, what if that, that worry, ironically, does not help us survive. It makes it harder to think and plan. And it also has negative health consequences like anxiety is not good for us. So I would say, you know, it's it, it's it may be this mashup that in modern day, you know, uncertainty helps us try to go for information. But if we kind of get stuck in the, oh no, instead of where uncertainty might be driving us, which is kind of a thing called deprivation curiosity, when we're deprived of some information, it, our brain actually goes on the hunt for information. It says, oh, I need to get some information. That's very different than worrying about mm -hmm. what might be happening. You, um there's a quote of yours that I think we shared when we promoted this event that just says, worrying does not take away tomorrow's troubles, it takes away today's peace. I don't know if that was you re-quoting someone else, but that feels like a, a really insightful way of sort of recognizing this. Uh, I, I'd love to talk more about the, the theory around this and particularly how this links to that amazing thing you said about work, anxiety being like a habit. But before we do that, we've already had people sharing a lot of sources of anxiety. I'd imagine a lot of people have come along to this today thinking, help me, deal better with the fact that I'm feeling anxious. And I know you've got some fantastic exercises, particularly one that might even work when we're in that sort of mode where like, oh, I can't I can't even do the basics. I can't, you know, I'm completely sort of like paralyzed by my anxiety. So maybe you could take us through something that can help us feel a bit more grounded in those situations. Sure. So we can think of anxiety as the spectrum, right? So everybody knows what anxiety feels like, you know, and then there are folks that have constant anxiety or severe anxiety. And then at the far end of that spectrum, you can think of panic, you know, panic. I think the definition is something like, you know, severe anxiety leading to wildly unthinking behavior. You know, when we're panicking, our, our prefrontal cortex is, is not only offline, it's like left the building. <laughs> so, so when we're really anxious or when we're really panicked, we can't actually take in new information. So notice the irony, you know, uncertainty drives us to get information, but when we're really anxious or really panicked, we can't take in new information. 
So the first thing that's really helpful to do when we're really anxious or panicked is to kind of ground ourselves, calm down a little bit so we can get that prefrontal cortex back online. And one of my favorite practices uh, is, and we've got a bunch of practices in our Unwinding Anxiety app, but this is something anybody, anybody can use, is called five finger breathing. And this, maybe I can walk us through it and then I can, ex- can explain right. how it helps right. that brain come back online. So, so we all can take, you know, take our hand. If you want to, if you, you can take your non-dominant hand, but if you want to challenge, you can take your dominant hand and hold it up. And then take your index finger of your other hand and place it at the base of your pinky. And here, what we're going to do is as we breathe in, we're going to pay attention to four things at once. The physical sensations on both hands, on both fingers, the physical sensations of breathing. And then we're also going to be watching our hand. Okay, so I'm going to watch my hand as I trace. And the idea here, as we breathe in, is we pay attention. So breathing in, we trace up our finger. As we breathe out, we trace down. As we breathe in, we trace up. As we breathe out, we trace down. As we breathe in, we trace up. As we breathe out, we trace down. As we breathe in, we trace up. As we breathe out, we trace down. As we breathe in, we trace up. And as we breathe out, we trace down. Okay, so that was five breaths. I'm wondering if folks could just pop in the chat if they notice any difference between now and five breaths ago. So I'm seeing the word slower, calmer, relaxed, definitely calmer, much calmer, more focused, peaceful. Um, yeah. a little bit calmer, more alert, uh, more connected to my body, made me yawn, a good distraction technique, less worry, <laughs> aware of my breath in the moment. So what a fantastically responsive audience. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can no. echo with that as well, which is it seems so counterintuitively simple. And yet there's something about the the focus on your body and your breathing and yeah. and the fact that you can't you can't really do anything apart from what you're doing, which is what I found that you're kind of, you're in that moment. Yeah. So you're highlighting something really important. And I would say, you know, if we were to add up all the responses, it looks like calm was probably the most common Mm. response that people had. So what's going on if we're anxious or if we're panicked and we, you know, we pull out our two hands and we do a five finger breathing exercise for five breaths. What this does is, you know, our, our brain has a part of it uh, called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that kind of holds working memory. It's like we hold a certain amount of information that we're using right now in mind. You know, it's like when we're trying to remember something on a, for a grocery list or trying to remember, you know, what somebody's name is that we're, you know, we're in conversation with. And that number is really not much more than four. And so if we pay attention to four things at once, it kind of hits that reset button on our working memory. And it kind of boots out everything else that was going on. And because it says, I can, I've only got room for four things and we're we're paying attention to four things. So often when we're really anxious, our, our mind is just going, oh no, oh no, oh no. Or we're worrying, you know, and that worrying can be in the background that gets booted out and then our brain resets. So that's one important piece here. But the other important piece is, you know, as folks commented on in the chat, that we, our physiology gets calmed down. We feel calmer. Okay. And typically our brain and body, our mind and body tend to um, riff off of each other. You know, so if our brain says, yeah, I'm I'm anxious and our body's like, yeah, now I'm feeling anxious. And then our body's like, I'm feeling anxious. And our brain's like, now I'm really I'm really anxious. And they just, you know, they riff off of each other. So if that, you know, if that worry thought stream is in there and it gets booted and our body calms down, if the, even if that thought stream comes back in, our brain says, I'm anxious. And our body says, you know, not really feeling it right now. I'm feeling calmer. So we can notice those thoughts and not get caught up in them as easily. So it's a really great way to kind of reboot the system but it's also a good way to help us see that we are not our anxious thoughts. You know, I had 
a pilot tester of our unwinding anxiety program wrote me an email when we were first developing this program and said, you know, I feel like this anxiety is deeply etched in my bones, right? That's how identified that person was with, with their anxiety. And here we can start to see, oh, these are thoughts. These are sensations. These are emotions. I'm not my thoughts. I'm not my emotions. I'm not my anxiety. And so we can start to notice thoughts and not take them so personally. So there's a difference between I'm anxious and I'm feeling anxious or I'm experiencing anxiety right now. Uh, so it's more about a passing experience rather than something that is defining you in a way. I just wanted to comment on uh, something I loved in the chat and grateful for. Somebody said, oh, I, I, I think it was on the lines of I benefited from that, but I actually got so anxious because the chat was moving so fast but I have to do it again. So that made me think two things. One is you can folks minimize the chat to get it out of your way if you're not a fan of it, but also you can do what that particular uh, community member did. I, I missed the name, which is to practice this again if you find yourself getting anxious. Presumably this is something that we have available to us and can repeat uh, as needed. Absolutely. We can you know, rinse and repeat whenever needed. Yeah. So you mentioned this ex exciting thing, I think earlier about how anxiety is potentially a habit. And of course, habits can be learned, but presumably can also be unlearned. Is that kind of one of the implications of that? Maybe you'd like to say a bit more. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, you know, any habit is formed through three key elements. So there's a, a trigger or a, or a cue and a behavior and a result. And the way that works, you know, it goes back to our evolutionary origins where you know before we had refrigerators we had to find food and remember where it was and we also had to uh, kind of map out where danger was and remember where that is as well and so these processes you know they're called positive and negative reinforcement you can think of our ancient ancestors you know they're exploring the savannah or the woods they find some food there's the trigger they eat the food that's the behavior. And then the result is that their stomach sends this dopamine signal to their brain that says, remember what you ate and where you found it. So positive reinforcement is really about memory formation, learning things, okay? And negative reinforcement is basically the same thing, but instead of a positive thing that says, oh, food, you know, this tastes good. It says, oh, danger, run away, you know? And so we, you know, we avoid whatever is unpleasant and then we learn to avoid that in the future. So it's really, it's a, it's a very basic learning mechanism and one that's been shown to be evolutionarily conserved all the way back to the sea slug. You know, Eric Kendall, who's a, a well-known neuroscientist got the Nobel prize in the year 2000 showing that this is, you know, this is at play in sea slugs, which who only have uh, 20,000 neurons. So very evolutionarily conserved process that's important. So that's, that's how we form habits. The other thing I'll mention is habits aren't necessarily a bad thing. I would suggest that habits are a very good thing. So we can all do this thought experiment. Imagine waking up in the morning and having to relearn everything. And by that, I mean, standing up, walking, putting on your clothes, talking, making breakfast, you know, we'd be exhausted before we got the tea or coffee made. <laughs> so, so most habits are actually really helpful because they free up our brains to learn new things. So I just want to highlight that because often we talk about bad habits, but I would say 98% of what we do is actually a helpful habit. It's just when things kind of get, you know, the wires get crossed a little bit in our brains that it, it becomes problematic. And so this is where anxiety comes in as a habit. So the feeling of anxiety, that feeling of worry can actually cause the mental behavior of worrying. I want to pause there for a second because often, you know, I think of behaviors as like a physical thing. You know, I, I eat or I smoke a cigarette or whatever, but we can, mental behaviors count too. They're actually really important. And worrying as that mental behavior can give us a little feeling of control or a feeling of at least we're doing something. And there's enough of a bump in reward there that's wh whether it's a distraction from the feeling of anxiety or that feeling of control, that it's rewarding enough for us to, for many, many people to learn to worry. And then that feeds back. So that the next time they feel anxious, they worry more. And then that worrying becomes that a very strong and ingrained habit that's hard to break. 
So this is why um, I really like the title of your well of, of this event and also your your app and your book and so on, unwinding anxiety. And I, and I, and I know we've already started with a sort of basic exercise, but I know you've got a lot more depth there, and people will be really keen to understand more. I believe you have a three-step process to help us unwind anxiety. So perhaps you'd like to lay out those steps so we can learn from them. I'd be happy to. Well, the first thing we can start with is, you know, in the the title of the book, I think. Uh, I think my wife came up with this uh, and I, you know, she's also suffered from anxiety in her life. I talk about that a little bit in the book, but the idea is when we're anxious, we feel really wound up, really tightened up, you know, in, in a little ball. And it's kind of like, you know, when we're afraid that fear says, Hey, you know, make yourself a, as small an object as possible for whatever danger might be out there. Now, anxiety, when, with, when we've got that fear of the future, we get all tightened up and wound up, uh, especially if we're worrying, you know, that worrying just winds us up more and more and more into that tighter and tighter ball. So it might be helpful for us just to kind of recognize like, oh, you know, this really can feel like a, you know, I'm, I'm all wound up. And the reason I mentioned that as a place to start is because that's, you know, kind of knowing how our minds work and seeing how our minds and bodies interact to cause this tightening, this winding up is really the first step for unwinding. And so I think of the first step is kind of mapping out any habit loop around anxiety. And I want to be clear here, anxiety itself it tends to be that trigger for a behavior. And we can get into some of the other, I've seen tons of different behaviors that come, came up over the pandemic or it got worse, where you know, worrying is one thing that we can do, but we also maybe we stress eat or we binge watch you know, our favorite television show or we go on social media or you know, the irony um, gets stuck on our newsfeed, which just makes us more anxious. Um, but you know, whatever that behavior is, We've got to map that out. So I often suggest to people, and we even have this, we put out a free habit mapper. I think the website's mapmyhabit.com. But the idea is anybody can pull this out and start mapping out their habit loops. I'll, I'll give an example of, of what I do in my clinic, actually. you know, So as I have a new patient, I'll give a specific example. How's that? I had a patient who came in, who was referred to me for anxiety, and I didn't know anything more than that. So he sat down, he looked pretty anxious. <laughs> so you know, I was like, okay. Let's see, let's see what the story is. And he talked about how he would get panic attacks driving on the highway to the point where he stopped driving on the highway, you know, cause he just couldn't do it. He was so afraid of getting panic attacks and he'd even get nervous, like driving a couple of miles to get to my clinic, uh, was anxiety provoking for him. And so after I took his history, I just pulled out a blank piece of paper and I wrote trigger behavior result on it. I said, okay, let me see if I've got this right. The trigger is you have this thought that you might get a panic attack or in what caused him in the first place was that he was having these fears that he might get in an accident. He might hurt somebody, he never gotten an accident, but you know, he'd have those fears and that those thoughts or and later the thoughts that he might get a panic attack would cause him to um, not drive on the highway. And then that not driving, the result of that was that, you know, he was really severely limiting his life, but at least he didn't have panic attacks on the highway. And so I just, I just wrote those three things down under the trigger behavior result. And I said, is this what's happening? And he said, yeah. And then I drew arrows between them, trigger to behavior, behavior to result, result back to trigger. And his eyes got really big. And I said, you know, what's going on? And he said, I never realized that's what my brain does. You know, so just taking 30 seconds to map out this habit loop, this guy had been having generalized anxiety for about 30 years. So his panic attacks were only a couple of <laughs> lasting for a couple of years, but he'd had a 30 year process that he didn't know that took 30 seconds to map out. And I'm not saying that everybody is that straightforward or simple, but what I'm saying is that most of our habit loops are pretty straightforward. And if we take a moment to start mapping them out, that will start to illuminate our experience for us in a, in a way that we've never noticed before. And, you know, our brains like certainty. Well, here's an example of certainty. We can say, look, here's what's happening as compared to, I have no idea, my brain's this black box and I just get anxious. Okay, so, so let's say we had a bit of an insight as to that process, that mapping, the, the, the thought loop. Um, it's still quite a way to go from recognizing it to then beginning to shift. 
So what's next in the unwinding process? Yes. So once we've mapped this out, I think of this as the second step, uh, which is really tapping into the strength of our brains. And our brains form habits through a process called reward-based learning. So positive and negative reinforcement can be summed up as reward-based learning. And it's called reward-based learning for a specific reason. And that reason is that when a behavior is rewarding, we're going to repeat it. And so if we got some reward from that behavior, and if we do it over and over and it continues to be rewarding, we're going to keep doing it. And it gets laid down as a habit to the point where we're not even paying attention to how rewarding it is. And back to your other work, this would be some kind of reward you might get from smoking a cigarette or comfort eating or something. There might be a dopamine hit. There might be some kind of short term, at least boost that we associate with that behavior. Is that, is that an example? Absolutely. So for example, in, if for anybody that smokes, they can ask, well, that cigarettes, they, they don't taste very good. What's rewarding in that? And typically when you look at when somebody starts smoking, so in, in my studies, in my lab, the average onset of smoking was about 13 years of age. So there's this huge amount of peer pressure, you know, in, in teenagers. And when we're teenagers, you know, we want to be cool. We want to fit in and what, or we want to rebel or whatever. And for a lot of people that comes in the form of learning to smoke. So we will literally choke down smoke and nicotine, which is a toxin to the point where we'll, we'll forego all of that, all those negative consequences, because the being cool at school is that much more rewarding. Right. And then we get uh, our body gets used to it and get addicted to the nicotine. And then <laughs> the irony is that we have to keep smoking to keep that nicotine going in our bodies because our, our brain says, Hey, you know, where's my nicotine. So yes, absolutely. That's, that's where any of these start. But to are you out. saying therefore that there is an equivalent sort of reward that we've got that's helped form these anxiety habits? Has there been some sense of like, this is, I mean, I guess back to your example, this driver felt that the cause of this avoiding driving the reward was feeling safer because he was no longer feeling at risk on the highway is that an, is absolutely that right? yeah and he wasn't having panic attacks or as many panic attacks yeah yeah so it you know that feeling of and for people that don't have panic disorder it can be just simply that feeling of control or that feeling of doing something mm. when they're worrying you know it's it's almost uh mythical for you know it's like oh if i if i worry then you know what is it going to make my family member more safe? Well, at least I'm doing something, but it's unlikely to change the circumstances. Mm. So, so the second step here is really tapping into that, in, into that reward-based learning system. And the way reward-based learning works is, you know, once we've set a habit, I think of it as set and forget. You set the, you know, set the behavior and you forget about the details. So the only way to break that or, or break into that cycle is by paying attention, bringing awareness in, and basically checking to see, is it still as rewarding as it was when I first learned it? So for example, uh, let's use a eating example. You know, a lot of, a lot of folks stress eat or, you know, or anxiety drives them to eat. So let's say that we've laid down the reward value for chocolate cake or, or chocolate uh, cookies or ice cream. You know, we can pick our favorite thing. And we can say, you know, let's say that we, um, it's chocolate cake. There's a new bakery that opens up down the street. So we go into the bakery and we think, oh, I wonder how good this cake is. And so we eat it. And if it's the best chocolate cake that we've ever had, our brain gets what's called a positive prediction error. We've predicted that it was going to be this good, but it was better than expected. That's on the positive side. That error causes our brain to fire and say, hey, remember this good bakery, good cake, come back here. On the other hand, if we eat the cake and we say, meh, I've had better, we get a negative prediction error because our brain says, yeah, not that great. Don't, you know, don't bother to come back here again. And those are the only ways to really change habits. We're going to either form habits more, if something's more rewarding, or we're going to start to break those if it's, if it's less rewarding. Notice how that has nothing to do with willpower or reasoning or convincing or telling ourselves that we, you know, we should stop worrying or stop overeating or whatever. So the key here is awareness is reigns supreme. If we pay attention and we see that something's not rewarding, we're going to stop doing it. To give you a concrete example, my lab just did a study with our Eat Right Now app where we embedded this craving tool in the app so we could have people pay attention as they overate. You ready for this? It only took 
10 to 15 times, 10 to 15 times of people paying attention for that reward value to drop below zero and for them to shift their behavior. Well, I, I've so, tried your eat right now and I, and I can really see in that context of like, is this thing that I associate with making me feel happy or whatever was, is it actually pleasurable? Do I feel good afterwards? And it was really interesting to bring that mindfulness because we haven't used that word very much, but you are very much a, a mindfulness practitioner. And this, this quality of attention is really the skill of tuning into what's going on right now. I guess as I sort of wind that example through to anxiety though, Dr. Judd, I, I'm, I f it feels slightly different to me because in anxiety, it feels a little bit less within my control. So for example, my daughter's been out this evening and her mobile phone's batteries died and my wife and I have been anxious as to whether she's okay. And that's a sort of very natural anxiety, but I don't feel like the, I don't know what's going on in terms of reward or fear there, but it feels like it's really natural to be really anxious about her. And I don't know quite how that relates to what we've been saying. Yeah, it's a good question. So it might be natural to be anxious, but it's not necessary. <laughs> so, okay. so we can, and I think one thing you're highlighting also is that the feeling of anxiety can just come on, you know, we don't really have much control over it. Mm. If that, if, or whether that spins into worrying, that is a little more under our control and not in the sense of we can just tell ourselves not to worry. We can do that. We can try that. I'm sure we've all tried that. It doesn't work very well, but what we can do is ask ourselves when we're worrying, how helpful is it? You know, and that's why I like to distill it to the simple question. What am I getting from this mm -hmm. and how, and not necessarily have it be an intellectual question, but really feeling into our direct experience. Like, let me ask you, what do you get? How does it feel when you worry? Mm -hmm. Uh, difficult. Well, it, 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 I guess the upside is it heightens my awareness that this is something that matters to me. For example, my daughter's safety. But I, I remember when I, mean, I said to my wife tonight, like us panicking about the fact she's out of contact right now isn't really helping. What we can do is we can calmly respond to the situation and try and find a way of contacting her. Or we can take a deep breath and just carry on and hope that she'll get back in touch. But actually, the panicking doesn't really help. So I think in some ways we sort of did that. But it's it's nice to hear you describe it because actually what you're really, I think what you're asking us to do is to bring our attention to what's going, kind of what's going on here. And is it helpful? Is that, is that a fair summary? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're also hinting at this third step. Um, but before we go on, does all that make sense in terms of this reward value? Because this is the trickiest piece. Well, I, I suppose what we're saying is, well, first of all, understanding what is the, the, the thought process, but secondly, then when you bring your awareness, presumably the key in with anxiety is noticing that the actual process of being anxious isn't actually very helpful in, mo in most cases. So, and when, and when you recognize that it's like, I'm not actually help making things any better by worrying, that's the enlightenment moment. Is that, is that, is that fair? Yes, absolutely. And when we realize that it's not helping, that's where we start to become disenchanted with the behavior. Mm. So just like in our studies of people who are overeating and they became disenchanted with overeating by paying attention. We've also done studies of people who want to quit smoking and we have them pay attention as they smoke. We don't tell them to quit smoking. We'd have them, we say, go ahead and smoke, but pay attention. And they start to realize that cigarettes taste like crap and they become disenchanted with that. We can also become disenchanted with the worrying. And that's, I think that's a direct contributor. We've actually shown mechanistically that um, that mindful awareness, which is, you know, this mindfulness is just a concept. So think, think of it as awareness, but with this particular attitude of curiosity, when we're curious, like, oh, what am I getting from this? Then we can start to see, oh, it's not giving me anything. It's actually taking away from my well-being. So when we become disenchanted with the old behavior, say worrying or overeating or whatever, then we can move into this third step, which is, I, I summarize it as finding the BBO, the bigger, better offer. Right. And what I mean by that is, you know, because our brains are set up this way to, you know, prefer things that are more rewarding, why don't we give our brains something more rewarding? And we can certainly find things that can give us brief relief, like, you know, distracting ourselves on social media or eating something or whatever, but those don't actually get at the root, you know, at the root and help us work with and be with anxiety. So it's really about changing our relationship to anxiety rather than habitually reacting by worrying or, or whatever. 
And so curiosity itself can be that bigger, better offer. When we're anxious, we can start worrying. Oh no. Or when we're anxious, we can get curious. Oh, what does this anxiety feel like in my body right now? And to our brains, when we compare worry versus curiosity, it's a no brainer. It curiosity. I mean, we've done studies on this. We can all do our own study on this. Like which one feels better, <laughs> you know, worry or curiosity, you know, it's pretty straightforward. So yeah. if we give our brains that, uh, that bigger, better offer, we can start to train our brains to naturally start to be more and more curious when we're anxious. And what that helps us do is start to see anxiety for what it is, sensations, thoughts, emotions, and we can relate to it differently. We can allow ourselves to feel these things instead of habitually reacting to them saying, oh, this is unpleasant. I got to distract myself or I've got to do something. I need to fix this or I need to find whatever triggered it. You know, the triggers are the least important part of this. It's really about relating to what's happening right now differently. You know, I think of it as don't worry about the why. Don't worry about why you're anxious. Worry about the what, what's happening right now. And are you getting caught up in a worry habit loop? And if so, can, get, can you get curious? Oh, which helps us step out of the worrying and into awareness. And then we can start to see, oh, I, you know, it, it's unpleasant, but I can be with it. Mm. Wonderful. Um, I've seen a few people in the, in the chat asking for more information about the, the app and how they can put these sort of three steps we've just been through into a bit more practice. So we're going to share a follow-up email, which has a link to... Dr. Judd's um, latest book on un unwinding anxiety and the app programs, which include the, the new anxiety one, but also the smoking and mindful eating ones as well. Um, and also a video with a bit more about that five finger breathing. So those will be coming to you. So please keep a lookout for those. Um, in a moment, we're gonna come to questions. So if you've, I've seen some questions posted in the chat, but if you'd like to share them folks in the Q and A and vote on each other's questions. So the most popular ones rise to the top, that would be great. Um, I just wanted to ask, because this is a topic that is always on my mind, which is about um, others as well as ourselves. Lots of us are dealing with anxiety ourselves. Lots of us also have loved ones that are anxious or colleagues we're worried about. And I know that when I'm with people who are, who are feeling anxious, I feel a little bit useless. Like mm -hmm. I can't, I can sort of see that they're experiencing anxiety, but I don't feel as though I can very effectively do anything to help them because it's they've kind of got to get through this process you've just talked through themselves. Is there anything we can do to bring this wisdom to the way that we are with others? It's a great question. So one thing that we can do is kind of a, a, a being rather than doing. And what I mean by that is I learned this phrase in residency, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> <laughs> Which you know is a play on the phrase, don't just sit there, do something. But the idea, if somebody comes into my office and they're anxious, if I'm not grounded myself, then I can catch their anxiety as a social contagion. And then suddenly I'm anxious. And then because of my anxiety, I might do something to fix them or help them, or I might jump to something because I'm anxious and I'm now on, on the edge of my seat. And so the idea here with the don't just do something, sit there, is that if we can learn to spot social contagion, you know, where we might be catching somebody else's emotion, I, we, can, we can be with the person rather than like do something to try to fix them or you know, make their anxiety go away. And I say that because you know, the, the trying to do something can actually just kind of make things worse. And so mm. it's just, it's really helpful to, you know, somebody's anxious, one of the best gifts we can give is to simply be with them, you know, and just to hold the space. Uh, the other thing I would say is, you know, you know, it's it, <laughs> when somebody is receptive, you know, and they're like, oh, I, you know, I need to work with my anxiety. You know, if there are resources that we have found helpful, then, you know, we can say, oh, you know, check out these resources. But the other thing I would say, and I, I see this a lot, you know, parents who want to help their kids, you know, mm. like my kid's anxious. The first I say, start with yourself, check to see and what your mind is doing. See if you can map out your own mental habit loops, whether they're fixing or worrying or any other types of habit loops that you might have as well. 
know your own mind first, because that'll help you be able to understand the mind of your kid or your loved one or your friend. So we can do this you know, with anyone. So I would say start, you know, start at home and really see how much you can explore and, and know your own mind. And then that puts you on a really solid grounding to be able to listen to somebody else and maybe even do some reflective listening so that we can, we can help others as well. Yeah, that's very wise. And of course, we've all seen that emotions are contagious to some extent. And when we're anxious ourselves, we're perhaps more likely to also contribute to other people's anxiety. Um, I wanted to start with uh, one of the questions that's near the top of this here from an anonymous um, uh, attendee, which relates to what we've just said, but it's sort of flipped the other way around and you know, back to someone who might be anxious, you know, ourselves. How can we explain anxiety to our partners or loved ones in a way that they can understand? This particular person says that their partner seems to think they can just push through. So is there a way that we can sort of open up about what we're going through in a way that allows others to, to perhaps be more likely to, to sit there and be there for us? Yeah, it's a great question. So here I would make sure that whoever we're trying to explain it to is truly open to listening. <laughs> yeah. And I say that because, you know, if somebody has comes into a conversation with an agenda, it doesn't matter how well, you know, we could explain something perfectly well and they're, it's just going to, you know, go in one ear and out the other. And they're going to say, but you should push through, you know, I, you know, so checking to see if they're receptive and even, you know, asking, you know, well, do you, do you want to know what my experience is? And then just kind of feeling into our experience of anxiety. And I would say, you know, I'm biased, but I would say kind of understanding this and mapping this out for ourselves can be very helpful in helping us be able to explain it to others as well. Mm. So, you know, if somebody else doesn't get it or they think we can just push through, here's where we can, you know, we can really take some time and explore it and, and really map out our own minds. And then we can lay that out for them and say, well, this is, this is what my mind does. This is what's happened when I've tried to push through, you know, they, they can go watch, show them the, there's this great uh, Bob Newhart skit from the 1970s that says, just stop it, you know, basically where it's, you know, it's been a meme forever where we think willpower is the way to go. Notice how, not nowhere in the neuroscience is willpower modeled. You know, it's it, neuroscientists don't talk about willpower. They talk about reward-based learning. And so but once, you know, understanding actually, once these you concepts discovered those added. thought loops that you talked about, if we can do that and sort of recognize, oh, this thing seems to be one of the key triggers of my anxiety, then that awareness may help us presumably avoid that trigger or help our, us make it clear to a partner or a loved one that that particular type of behavioral situation is more likely to cause me to go into that loop. So maybe, maybe there's an awareness that also allows you to sort of change to some extent the situations you put yourself in, or, or is that a bit of a defeatist approach to this mapping? I, I caution, so certainly avoiding triggers, you know, can, can make it less likely that we're triggered, yet that tends to get us into a limited uh, mindset in life. So it suddenly mm -hmm. we're narrowing, narrowing, narrowing and trying to avoid everything and trying to control everything. Well, unfortunately life doesn't work that way. So a, um, a strategy that might be even more helpful than that is to really learn how to, to roll with whatever's happening. And so if a trigger happens, you know, often our, you know, if our partner or loved one, you know, they have some habit that triggers us, we're, we're telling them to change for us. And it, it, it might be some kind of innocuous habit. And so here we can step back and say, well, how can I learn to relate to that differently? You know, where they might just be doing something that, that annoys me or makes me anxious. Mm, thank you. That's really wise. Alex has asked, can you talk about the impact of diet on anxiety? And I guess this is a two-way thing. We've talked about comfort eating in response to stressors. And I guess I wonder if what we eat can also contribute to the anxiety we experience. Yeah, so just in the interest of time, I would say yes, <laughs> what we eat can contribute. And for, for because we all are individual, it, you know, the type of food can be affect us differently. So I would say this is something that we can all explore is like, when I eat this, does it, you know, does it contribute to my anxiety? Does it not? Hmm. So again, it's back to that awareness. Um, someone who's just got the name S, so I'm not sure what that's short for, but they're another popular question. How do we deal with health anxiety? I guess this is a really big theme around COVID and long COVID and sort of the, the, the period we find ourselves in now. Right now, there are people also anxious around the, 
the heat wave and the future implications of you know for health and so on um it's a particular case of what we've talked about i guess yes so i wouldn't i wouldn't really say much different besides um you know and this actually brings together the grounding exercises like the five finger breathing so if we get a lot of health anxiety you know so obviously if there's something going on that we need to pay attention to and check to see you know is this truly something that is affecting my health our thinking brain it's our thinking brain is going to help us most there as compared to our worry you know our brain getting into worry mode so no matter what it is, uh, you know, what is it? Keep calm and carry on uh, from the from the UK. Yeah. If we can, if we can keep calm, we can carry on with what we need to do. And if we need to check something out, you know, to reduce the uncertainty, to see, oh, you know, here's something new that I've never experienced before. I need to research this and see if this is a problem. Then we can keep calm and carry on and do that. If it's, you know, it's a, an ache or a pain or something that's causing us to worry and worry and worry that's where we can play, you know, we can really use these three steps and start to uh, work with the worry itself. Mm. Omin is asked, um, have you heard that highly sensitive people are more likely to suffer from anxiety? Or I guess she's asking, is that true? There's, a, there's actually a measure in, in the scientific research called anxiety sensitivity. So I don't know if that's what this person is referring to. And there, you know, there's quite a bit of research showing that some people score much, much higher on the anxiety sensitivity index uh, than other people. Mm. Um, a, a theme that I often see linked to anxiety is kind of an Angelina's question. Could you speak about anxiety and OCD, which I think is obsessive compulsive disorder? Mm -hmm. um, she was diagnosed with OCD years ago and then recently diagnosed with generalized anxiety in addition. Um, and some days feels like an endless loop dealing with both. How do they relate? Yes, I, I think, and not that this matters that much, but I think OCD falls within the anxiety disorder spectrum. I don't mm -hmm. like the word disorders because, you know, it's like we all have one condition. It's called the human condition, you know, and so, you know, these, these things are set up more for billing purposes. The, but we can start to notice, you know, how with obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, if we get some compulsion to do something, what gets us to do it? It's often that anxiety that revs up and up and up and says, do this, do this. And then when we do it, it we get the relief and we can notice, you know, so the compulsions that trigger or that, you know, could be an obsession. It could be a compulsion. Something is a trigger that anxiety builds. It's like the steam building in the tea kettle. And then, you know, in, it, it's, it feels like it's going to blow pop its top until we do whatever that uh, behavior is. We do the behavior and then we get this relief. We've relieved uh, the steam, the pressure, and then that feeds back. So our brain, the next time our brain has that, you know, the obsession or the compulsion, it says, Oh, do that again. You'll feel better. And then we can get really locked into these loops. So yeah, the two are, you know, the two are pretty related. Thank you. Um, Susan's asked about curious about your thoughts on drinking to alleviate anxiety. And I guess it's probably a broader category here of things that we do to try and deal with our anxiety in this case, in social situations. Um, are some of these sort of coping mechanisms helpful? What are your thoughts? Well, if we look at, you know, in psychiatry, we often try to get a sense for, is something causing a problem for somebody? You know, so with drinking alcohol, for example, you know, if somebody is has a lot of social anxiety and they have, you know, an alcoholic beverage out in pub, you know, when they're out of the pub or something with some friends or coworkers. And, you know, that's what everybody's doing. There's, you know, socially acceptable. It's not, it's not causing them any problems, you know, for some people that can, that can be helpful. Um, and then if we start, you know, having multi, you can see how that could become a habitual pattern for some people where they're drinking too much or it's causing problems for them. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll go to, we can just imagine all the different scenarios. So certainly it can, it can, that can go down a spectrum. But if, if I'm understanding the question, somebody could say, well, you know, having a drink in, in social situations is really helpful for me. It might be helpful for them. And somebody else might say, well, you know, I want to learn how to work with this social anxiety myself. And so the drink might not give us the opportunity 
to see that as a challenge be like, okay, you know, I'm going to work with my mind. Let me see if I can work with this social anxiety and not have a drink tonight, for example, uh, and see what that's like to be with it. So if we've, if we've done some type of mental training, we want to use that as a kind of a, a way to, to further the training, a challenge and there, there, we can certainly play with it that way. Mm, but really it's back to this point about if we bring our awareness and notice what's going on, and then we can ask ourselves, is this helpful or not? And actually you reminded me that when I had a really bad physical pain problem in my back, and it was when I learned to bring my attention to the pain rather than trying to get away from it, that I was able to, it sort of dissipated. And I guess to some extent, that's what you're asking us to do with our anxiety, which is bring our attention to like, what's, what's going on right now, but in, in a slightly more curious way, so that it hopefully dissipates a bit and it takes some of the energy out of it. Um, we're running out of time, Dr. Joe. This has been enormously helpful. I wanted to end with, again, the, the top question on the list is from Liz here. And I think you've already done this to a large extent. She says, please talk about anxiety as a habit. And we have talked about that and give us some resources. So maybe the invitation here is just to share or remind us what some of the resources are that you might recommend people check out as a result of today's event. Well, I would say the biggest resource that we all have is our minds and our curiosity. And so best resource is to you know, uh, start exploring our minds, uh, map these habits out, explore what we're getting from them, and then, you know, really build this superpower of curiosity. Uh, and, you know, I'm biased, but I'm, I wrote a book, you know, created an app. So those can be resources that might be helpful for some people. But really, we all we all have these resources, which is awareness and curiosity. Well said, thank you. And I wanted to just acknowledge everyone who's been involved in this really active, engaged community. Great questions, uh, lovely responses. Thank you for sharing what's going on for you right now. I hope you found this helpful. We will send around a link to this conversation so you can watch again and share and to Dr. Judd's fantastic books and apps so you can dive a bit deeper and the video. Do remember the five finger Breathing, I find that really helpful. I've, I've done various breathing techniques, but never actually used that one. And I, I found it really engaging. So Dr. Joe, keep up the fantastic work. Thank you so much for your time. Is there any final thought you'd like to leave us with as we part today? Stay curious. A lovely note to end on. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you everyone for being here and look forward to uh, continuing to use and share your work. Mm -hmm.